Win Win 20% off Black Friday sale, November 21 through 28th. Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. It's November 2021 and we're in the Mirage 2000C. This module has been out for some years but there's recently been a massive overhaul to the radar in terms of air to air, BVR, beyond visual range and air to ground radar, ground mapping and terrain avoidance. We're going to present this to you as a radar refresher video. If you want to know the absolute basics of beyond visual range radar, we have an initial video to go over that. They'll teach you the absolute basics of radar. The scope of this video is we will cover the panel here under the throttle handle. We'll cover the VTB, otherwise known as the HDD, otherwise known as the radar screen here. And we may look a little bit at the HUD. We are not going to be employing weapons. That is covered in the separate weapons videos. First, radar power switch, rotary, off, warming up, operational but standby, and on, or fully operational. Next, reset. If you have a problem with the radar, we can reset it here. Next, change radar channel A, not modelled. Validate channel, not model. Change radar channel B, not modelled. This is a rheostat to change the gain for the ground modes. Next switch is the main lobe filter reject switch. So this is a pulse Doppler radar, it means it's great at picking out things that are moving against the background, but to do that, it has to employ several different filters, and this one is for the main lobe filter. With, this means it'll use the main lobe filter all of the time to filter out the background noise. Automatic, it will only use it when it detects that the background noise, the ground noise, is too much, and will help reduce notch resistance. And without, no main lobe filtering at all. Massive notch resistance, but also we're gonna get lots of background noise. For this video, obviously, I'm gonna assume you are familiar with how a pole stopler radar works. Test switch for testing the radar. This one here allows us to change between PPI and B-scope mode. So, if we can see the VTB here, that is PPI mode, that is B-scope mode. B-scope stretches the scanned area in front of the aircraft into a square and we now see it as that square there. The thing going left and right is the B sweep and it's sweeping along the B scope. If you don't want it stretched into a square and you want it presented to you how it actually is which is like a wedge shape because that's the shape of the radar scan zone kind of like that and like that sweeping around this kind of fan segment shape here that is PPI. With PPI there is no distortion of the geography of the returns in front of you. B-scope mode there is distortion as it stretches it into a square. Next two air to ground modes we've got deck mode and visu mode and we'll come back to those. Radar A mode this will increase the radar filtering of the background noise generally. Next TDC mode, ANG mode or ALT mode. This cross here is the TDC. We can aim the elevation of the radar up and down. I'll show you the controls later but that's moving it up and that's moving it down. And we know it's currently in ANG mode because we can see that the radar coverage in elevation is being shown as an upper and a lower limit. 2,000 feet to 9,000 feet in this case or if we went to ALT mode we can now see that the center of the scan zone is shown. 5,000 feet, 8,000 feet, 11,000 feet, and so on. Almost all of the time, it's going to be in altitude mode, and you'll just leave it like that. Next, bars. If we look at our radar, you can see this guy zipping along here. That's the actual antenna sweeping left and right, and it's known as a B-sweep. Every time it covers a left to right or a right to left, that is a bar. That's just how a radar works. How many bars do we want in each search pattern? One bar, two bars, four bars, and some aircraft have six and eight bars. The way the bars work is that they're stacked on top of each other in terms of elevation or altitude. If we just have one bar, we've got very little altitude covered because just one bar, which is about four or five degrees in terms of elevation. If we have four bars stacked together in the pattern, it'll be one, up, two, up, three, up, four, so that will cover much more elevation, about 20 degrees of elevation, because it's four bars stacked on top of each other, but to complete the search pattern takes four times as long. 
There's always a trade-off when using radars because there is very limited power because it's an airborne fighter radar. So it's normal to switch between whether you want low elevation coverage but quick refresh or a good high elevation coverage but slow refresh. I'm going to skip to this one here because it complements the pattern bar very well. If a target has disappeared from the radar because it's been shot down or because it's doing a radar notch, I'm going to assume you know what a radar notch is, how quickly do we want it to disappear from our radar screen? N, it'll disappear straight away as soon as the B sweep detects that that target is no longer there. Or R, it will persist on the radar screen for two patterns. Next, pulse repetition frequency. Again, we have limited power and scanning time. We can optimize our radar for seeing different types of targets. High repetition frequency at the top here. That's better for spotting targets with a high closure rate. Also, BFR stands for low repetition frequency. This is useful for spotting targets with a low closure rate. And finally, a middle mode, kind of automated or interleave mode, which will switch between the two and be an overall best case. If you know the target's gonna be fast, HFR. If you know the target's gonna be slow in terms of closure rate, BFR. If you're not sure, leave it in interleave mode. Next, the range of the radar display, and we can go up and down, and we'll cover that later. Next, PSIC or STT mode. We can change from TWS to STT, so from PSID to PSIC in French, manually by pressing this button. Most of the time, it will be done automatically anyway, but you can do it manually. Again, I assume you already know what those terms mean. And finally, the scan size in terms of azimuth. Do we want to scan 60 degrees left and right, 30 degrees left and right, or 15 degrees left and 15 degrees right? 60 degrees covers the most area, but it means a slower pattern, a slower refresh rate. 15 degrees will only cover, you know, 15 left, 15 degrees right, but we'll get a very quick pattern. You want a super quick pattern, go 15 degrees with one bar pattern, and it will zip along in super fast time. So those are our manual radar controls. Most of them are going to be controlled via our HOTAS, and we'll talk about those controls later. Some of them, the ones that we don't use very often, will be actually clicked on here with the mouse. So let's start with the physical controls around the outside of the VTB. First, power switch, off or on. Next, brightness of different elements. The TDC, which we'll talk about in a bit. We've got overall video contrast. I'm right-clicking and left-clicking to change them, by the way. Uh, we've got symbology and we've got markers. Next, feed. Basic radar or TV where the radar is essentially disabled. Next, declutter. A temporary switch where you press and hold it and it removes the tactical BUTs or the waypoints from the screen that aren't on at the moment. Next, we've got eight controls for manually entering target information. Let's just very quickly show. So, this is a left and a right click right click to initialize it to enter data you've got which waypoint are we interested in for the target so waypoint one or but one we've got the distance from that waypoint to the offset target in nautical miles let's say uh, 20 nautical miles we've got the angle or the bearing from the waypoint or the but to the target the offset target in degrees obviously we've got a heading associated with that target currently due north but we could change that as well we've got a barometric altitude in hundreds of feet associated with the target we've got a marker speed associated with the target and we've got a time associated with the target to accept that target information we can left click to validate so right click to initialize here to entry left click to validate if you want to reject that target where RAS shows here we can click there to reject the target that's the manual target entry. Next, let's look at the symbology. So, why don't we start with heading tape. Magnetic heading tape at the bottom here currently shows that we're heading 079 or thereabouts. Next, our own ship. This is where we are and we're always facing in this 12 o'clock position. Our speed is also shown by the length of this green vector here. Our calibrated airspeed shown here in knots, 271. Our current altitude in hundreds of feet, barometric, 
6600 feet. Our current radar mode, PID, known as Track While Scan TWS in other fighters. Next we have the currently selected waypoint or BUT waypoint 1 also shown by that cross there. Also distance in nautical miles and the magnetic bearing from waypoint 1 to our TDC. I may also refer to the TDC as the cursor as we can move it about. Next antenna elevation as you know we can tilt our radar up and down. This is our antenna elevation scale. Zero directly level, 30 degrees up, 30 degrees down. You can see that the carrot is where it is at the moment. It's moving up and down in four stages because remember our search pattern we selected four bars. If we change it to two bars this would just be moving up and down twice and this would say two. If it was just one, it would say nothing and this guy would stay completely still because it wouldn't be moving up and down in terms of elevation at all. As shown, we have it in PPI mode, not B-scope mode. You can see the B-sweep moving left and right here, completing bars every time it goes from left to right or right to left. Zero degrees azimuth deflection. 30 degrees right, 30 degrees left, 60 left, 60 right. If we were to change it to 30 degrees and two bars, we can see now two bars and just a segment we're scanning here, 30 degrees left, 30 degrees right. Any hostiles no longer being encapsulated by 30 degrees left, 30 degrees right have now disappeared. Let's go and put it back, uh, 60 degrees and four bars. Next. The range shown, not the range of where the radar is scanning, but the range of the display, currently set to 40 nautical miles. So we are there. In terms of distance, 40 nautical miles is here. If we want to increase or decrease with that switch down the bottom left, I've actually got it bound to my HOTAS. We can go out to 80, out to 160, 320, or we can go in. Let's leave it on 40. Next. Our current pulse repetition frequency is set to HFR. It was that switch that we had three positions that we looked at earlier. Also our current channels, six and seven. Next, our attitude indicator. That there is our nose. That there is the horizon. We are pitching down slightly. And they're level. That means we're not rolling at all. This allows us to fly the aircraft while being heads down in the VTB. Next, the aerial radar targets. I'm just going to pause it here. The chevrons are aerial targets, they're aeroplanes. The number on the right of them is the closure rate. This guy here is closing at Mach 0.9. This guy here, Mach 0.2. Some of them may be heading towards us, some may be heading away, some may be heading side to side. Note there are some small differences in the chevrons. Some of them have these little wings at the top here. Some of them, just not these ones shown here, will have a little line at the bottom. Those are to differentiate at which bar of the pattern picked up that contact. So this guy here was picked up by bar one of four. If it had the line at the bottom or an underscore as we like to call it, it would be picked up by bar four. Some of them are picked up by multiple bars. So this aircraft here that looks like two aircraft, it's not, it's just one. You can see it's two chevrons. Neither of them have a little wing at the top or an underscore at the bottom. That means this one here was picked up by bar two and this one was picked up by bar three. Well, how can an aircraft be picked up by more than one bar? It's not like they can be one aircraft on top of the other in terms of altitude. Well, it's because the bars actually slightly overlap by a fraction of a degree. And if the aircraft is in that slight overlap between the two bars, it will return twice. This is basically just raw data that we're looking at here with the lobe filters applied. So this guy is actually one target being picked up on bars two and three. Next is our TDC or our cursor. This allows us to manipulate things, to lock targets and so on. I can move it about and it's probably a good idea to look at some controls. We're not gonna look at a massive amount of controls, just the basics. So to move the cursor around, TDC up, down, left and right, or you could also bind an axis for them. Next, if I want to slew the radar antenna up in terms of elevation and down, we've got radar antenna up and down, and again, we've got an axis command that you can go and choose. Next, range. 
radar range increase, radar range decrease. With those commands, you can see I can move the TDC about here. I can also manually slew the radar elevation up and down. And I can zoom the display out and in. Uh, one thing I just forgot to say was that if these aircraft are closing, the Chevron will be in a down position like that. If they were opening, going that way, then they will be in an up position with the point at the top. On the left of the TDC is the distance in nautical miles from us to the TDC. On the right of the TDC is a very important concept at the location that the TDC is representing, so ahead of us and right a bit by 33 miles, what are the upper and the lower altitude coverage of the radar? Well, we're currently covering 9,000 feet barometric to negative 20,000 feet theoretical barometric. Now, what if I tilted the radar elevation up a little bit? Well, we're now scanning at this position here between 21,000 feet and negative 8,000 feet. So if I was looking for an aircraft here that was above 21,000 feet, it wouldn't find it. So it's important if I'm looking for a target here, the AWACS has told me he's at 30,000 feet, for instance, I manually aim the antenna up to cover 30,000 feet. It's now from 40,000 feet to 11,000 feet. I've now got the radar in terms of elevation covering the altitude that's needed. This is a dynamic process that you will constantly do all of the time. Note, the difference between that and that is the size of the pattern. Four bars at the moment, so it's a lot. If I went down to one bar, the difference between that and that would be very low. We'd be scanning a very low amount of altitude or elevation coverage. The only other thing to point out is when I move the position of the CDC, these change because we have a diversion scan zone in terms of elevation and azimuth. As we move away from our own ship, the extents of the azimuth and elevation will diverge. Next, why don't we lock one of these aerial targets? In fact, why don't I show you the setup? Here's me. Here's a bunch of A-10s on a continuous loop. Four baddies, one goodie. Next, why don't I lock one of the targets in a TWS lock or track and see the extra information? Well, all I've got to do is move this to one of these targets and press target lock. There. Press that once. Pause it there. And we now have a lock or track on that target. A standard, it's a PID or TWS lock or track. The bonus of this type of track is that as well as tracking this target and having the ability now to put a missile on this target, we can also still scan for other targets. So I can see where this target is, or I can see where this target is. It is the preferred way of tracking a target. If we were to actually fire a missile at this guy, we would change to a PSIC or an STT, which would be done automatically anyway, so we don't have to worry about it. With the target lock, we have some extra symbology. Targets, speed, mark 0.3. Targets bearing, he is moving in that direction there, 256 degrees. Closure rate in knots, and targets altitude in hundreds of feet, 16,600 feet barometric. Also note, with the track while scan lock, we no longer have a four bar search pattern. We're now down to a one bar search pattern. And correspondingly, the elevation coverage of the pattern is much smaller. It's now 20,000 feet to 15,000 feet, a difference of only 5,000 feet. Presumably a limitation of what the radar can do while it's tracking a target. Also, we have the target movement vector here. Kind of hard to see, but from him there, he is moving in that direction there and his speed relates to the length of that vector there. Also, his azimuth from us is displayed as this long green line. Finally, target aspect. If you can see under there, well, in fact, let me just move my TDC out of the way. I can move it away while he's locked. Also, you can see here's the lock target because these two vertical lines stay on him while the TDC cross moves. The target relative aspect or angle is also shown here by 15. That means direction that he's flying is 15 degrees offset from directly towards me. If it was zero, he would be heading directly towards me. 180, directly away from me. It's 15, and as you can see, his vector has moved slightly to my right, is 15 degrees off. In fact, why don't I just show you what happens when he turns? I think he's turning around here. So watch that number change, presuming that he is turning. 
no, it doesn't look like it's turning anymore. But what that's showing is that rather than coming directly towards me, he's offset 15 degrees. I hope that makes sense. Also, his range from us to him is 14 nautical miles. Note that we are not in an air-to-air -air mode and we do not have a missile selected at the moment. So we have no lock symbology shown on the HUD. If we were, then we would also have target information shown on the HUD here for weapons deployment. But that is outside the scope of this video. It will be covered in the weapons video. We can also force the radar track from a TWS or PID into a STT, a single target track, otherwise known as a PSIC, by pressing this button here or the hotel command for it. Watch what happens when we press that. Ping. Now, when you do that, note, no longer is the radar scanning for other targets. It concentrates all of its energy on the single target track here. Hence, this guy has disappeared. Also, in this mode, we can detect the type of aircraft, assuming that he's within a certain range and aspect, and he is within range and aspect, so we can tell that he's an A-10. Now, we could transfer back to a PID or a track while scan, like that. Note, we no longer see what type of aircraft he is. And the other guy, well, will appear. I don't think he's appeared yet. Ah, <laughs> I see what's happened. Can you see p -sick flashing there? It just so happens we've got within a certain threshold of range at which it's automatically turning on our p -sick here, or our STT. Uh, so I'm not actually sure. I can actually turn it back to PID at this point. No, I don't think I can. Note also we've lost the type of aircraft here, and that's because he's no longer within parameters of A range and B aspect, and that's because he's turning around. He's 40 degrees to our right now, 45 degrees, 50 degrees to our right. Next, I'd like to show how to lose the track, and we're going to press Weaponed System Command, depress. Ping. And we've reverted back to scan, and we're in PID or track while scan mode. That's the basics of the air-to-air -air mode and manipulation of the radar without using weapons, so PID, PSIC, or track while scan and SCT. Next, let's look at IFF, identification, friend or foe. Who's a good guy and who's a bad guy? So we've reset, we've got a bunch of contact on the radar here. Let's go to the IFF power knob. Three settings, off, sector search, or full search. Off is off. Sector search will only search, or should I say only interrogate, contacts along a certain vector, and it will be the vector where the TDC is on the radar. Or the third mode, full. This will interrogate all contacts within the scannable area in front. In real life, there is a good reason to only use sector because you might not want to interrogate certain transponders out there. In DTS, that doesn't matter. You might as well always just use full. Of course, the IFF system here means that the radar is performing a mode for transponder interrogation. Any hostile aircraft out there will come back with a blank, no response. Any friendly aircraft out there will come back with a friendly transponder handshake. All you have to do to interrogate is press and hold nose wall steering IFF interrogate. While you hold that down, it will do the interrogation. As soon as you stop holding it down, it will stop. When we hold it down, we can see that we get an extra line at the top of the radar. And any hostile that is responding with a friendly squawk has a diamond by it. Remember, there are lots of bars and lots of scans happening, so you will get repeated signals and you just have to learn to see through that. So this contact here, no diamond, hostile. This one, no diamond, hostile. This one, no diamond, hostile. No diamond, hostile. No diamond, hostile. And this one, diamond friendly. Let's uh, show that on this screen here. Hostile, 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 friendly. I should also show this will show on the HUD as well. So the HUD symbology to show, we need to be in an air to air mode. So let us select Super 530. And I'm going to lock the friendly guy, which is that guy there. As we do, let's lock. We get the target designator box there. So that's where he is. It's not showing friendly yet because it only shows friendly when you've locked a target if you are in PSIC or STT mode. So let's change, as we saw earlier, to PSIC or STT like that. We've now got him in a PSIC mode, and you can see he's got an A in his designated box and a line underneath it. If we locked a hostile, it would just be a normal designated box without the A. So, 
to reiterate. There is symbology to show that the hostile is a friendly in the HUD if we are tracking them or we've got a lock on them and we are in PSIC slash STT mode. And that is as far as IFF goes in the Mirage. It's very simple. Main thing is just remember to turn the IFF knob on here, otherwise none of it will work. Next, let's look at some air to ground modes. Next, let's look at two modes for ground avoidance. First, DEC mode and then SHB mode. DEC mode. Let me get myself in a precarious position in terms of altitude and I move closer to these mountains, get rid of my pilot. I'm gonna put here DEC mode on so, all of these symbologies are as we saw before, except the following. We are now in DEC mode. The range is 10 nautical miles, but in DEC mode we can go out no further than 10 miles. We're locked in 10 miles. H, my current radar altitude, also shown up in the HUD, there. Next, my safety clearance threshold. Probably easiest if I set this to z zero, first of all. We set it using the radar elevation commands, as we saw set up earlier so if I bring it down to zero our safety clearance threshold is now set to zero which means that it is at the same altitude as me if I increased it it means say 400 my safety clearance threshold is now 400 feet below me let's put it back to zero these colors are the radar returns from the terrain the darker the green the lower the return is or the lower the terrain is relative to my safety clearance threshold once we get to a red color that means that that part of the terrain is at the same level as the safety clearance or above so with this set to zero the red terrain is at exactly the same level as me or above which means that if i were to keep at this altitude and move into the red terrain i would blow up because i would hit it it's all about terrain avoidance usually you would have a safety margin set of say 1500 therefore all of this terrain here is above the safety threshold of 1500 feet below me note there are some gaps in the return all this black here is not returning that's because it's water and it's not reflecting the radar back to me there are some black bits here in the mountains that is the shadow or the rear faces of the mountains that we can't highlight with our radar that is the essence of DEC mode but we have an improved version. What if we want to do air-to-air -air combat and do terrain avoidance? Like if we were fighting in fog or something. Well, we can do that as well. So I'm actually going to turn off the EC mode. Back to our standard air-to-air -air scope. I'm going to find a bad guy. That guy there. Lock him up. Got him locked. Now I'm going to press DEC mode. We've now got a combined mode known as SHB and it's pretty much the concatenation of both types we've got our pid track while scan lock as normal and superimposed onto that is the dec so we can do terrain avoidance while fighting and tracking the target and you can see now we've got all of the usual target information uh, and we are in shb mode next let's reset and look at visu mode visu mode another air to ground mode Put a pilot the zoom mode is there this time we're showing the raw returns of the radar from the terrain but instead of the different shades of green being altitude they are the strength the raw strength of the return so things that reflect radar better are showing as a lighter color of green it's a ground mapping mode basically we're in visu mode here we've got our radar altimeter there in this mode we can range out out to 40 miles and of course we can range in as well for more detail in the scope as well as that we can like deck mode i forgot to show you you can change between 60 and 30 if you're in 30 less coverage but a quicker refresh which is useful especially if you're moving fast and finally gain if the gain is too high or too low we can change this rheostat here to increase the gain or reduce the gain We've quickly jumped to the desert just to show a typical use for a ground mapping radar. We're in a desert here which is nice and featureless and very low radar returns. And in them is a bunch of stuff we want to find, a bunch of tanks, a bunch of buildings. And I want to see if I can find them with my radar. And pause. Get rid of our man. Press our visu mode. Let it populate. Range to 20 miles. And already 
you have to get used to seeing this kind of thing but already we can see contacts but just pause it there you can see objects returns which are going to be those buildings and those tanks and well, you can see them out there which is a very useful feature especially if you're in ifr conditions and you can't actually see what's out there same will apply for ships that if you can't see them with your eyes for some reason because of the fog well, we can turn on our radar and locate the ships via the ground mapping and finally the last mode we're going to show is tas which is air to ground ranging which is typical uh, with an air to ground radar capable aircraft so master arm on select air to ground gun weapon system command forward to engage air to air guns and as long as TAS is selected here which it is the radar will now move into TAS mode air to ground ranging mode so it's no longer looking for baddies up in the sky this will of course make air to ground gunnery and rockets and whatnot much more accurate you don't have to use it but it's obviously best if you can use it and we can aim down at the ground we get a very accurate return of 5.5 kilometers here which is going to help the WCS calculate our shot solution for the weapon that we've got here in terms of the VTB here it says TAS here and it shows our various credentials but otherwise nothing really of interest there that is our summary of the radar in air to air and or air to ground modes in the Mirage 2000 as of November 2021 we've covered PID mode, PSIC mode, DEC mode, SHB mode, VISU mode and TAS mode there are of course other relatively low range auto aerial acquisition modes known as ACM modes they are covered in a separate video in our ACM radar within visual range tutorial Otherwise, I hope that was useful and see you later.